All right. Now, thank you, Don. Uh, cool. That was neat. Uh, can you guys in the back like see this? Like that all? Good. Great. Um, okay. So uh, this is going to be automated acceptance testing, uh, automated acceptance tests from scratch. So who here in the room has heard of automated acceptance tests? Show of hands. Great. We're off to a good start. Uh, who here actually has put that into like practice at their workplace? Okay, not so many hands. That's why you guys are here. What we want to do is we're going to basically walk through how to do this thing from start to finish. That's the, that's the plan. Uh, first and foremost, who am I? Uh, I'm obviously Dan Davis. Uh, I've been a software developer for about eight years now. And uh, fun fact about me, uh, I was I went to see LaserCat uh, in DC. And if you were probably wondering, like, well, what is LaserCat? This is a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is what LaserCat is. <laughs> There's a couple of things that are really fabulous about this picture. Number one, yes, that is a giant inflatable cat head. Um, number two, yes, those are lasers. And number three, yes, I am indeed wearing a uh, sweater with cats with lasers in their eyes. So, like, I felt really appropriately dressed to be there. It was great. Uh, so, uh, it was fantastic. Uh, so, but seriously, uh, who am I? So, uh, I really kind of came from the Java world. Uh, that was sort of my development background where I spent a lot of my time learning things. And then I kind of switched over to Python uh, about two years ago, so I'm sort of uh, you know, becoming more experienced in that area, but still learning things. Um, I've also been doing a lot of like DevOps work, so uh, a lot of what I've been doing now is like provisioning servers and making things, uh, standing up environments, working on build flows and that sort of stuff. And you know that's been really fascinating and interesting work. And I will talk your ear off about those subjects if you ask me. Um, I was first introduced to automated acceptance testing about two years ago. So uh, actually, when I came to Accelo, that was really great. They mentioned that to me, and I was like, well, what is that? Tell me more about it. Uh, Stephen Ritchie got me into this subject, and it was like, this is a way for us to, uh, to test things you know, in a more whole, wholesale level, at the, the highest level possible. And now, I actually have built this at my client, you know, and that's great. That's, you know, I'm, I'm able to get this all put together. So this is what my typical day works like. Um, I have Jenkins, and that's my deployment uh, tool. So this is an automation system that allows me to uh, run jobs. I use a tool like Ansible, or Puppet, or Chef, or Docker uh, to deploy something to a server. Great. That's easy, that's straightforward. That's basically how that, that like a, a you know, a DevOps type world works. But the question is, now that it's up, how do I know that it's working? Like, how do I know? And oftentimes what we see is it's like, well, that's easy. You just go on the website and you click around and you make sure that it works, right? Like, no problem. This is really easy and simple to do. Here's the problem with that approach, though. It's really bad at scaling. So if I want to do this, and as my, as my website gets bigger and bigger and we add more and more functionality, this just becomes a huge pain in the butt. Also, I spent a whole lot of time automating this thing. So the client's like, hey, we would really, really like to be able to do this more frequently. Can we do this you know, once a week, once a day? If we're manually testing this stuff every single time, it's just it's not a sustainable model. That's not going to work for us. So we desperately need a way in which to actually test the functionality of the website in an automated fashion. All right? But good news. Automated acceptance testing can help. So what is it? Um, it's basically tests that are written at the functional or the business level. So again, at the highest level possible. Um, it can be read by non-technical people. This is really important. It's not, uh, when we talk about like unit tests and things like that, that's something that's at the very, very specific, it's the code level. We want this to be something that people can actually see. Uh, something that uh, uh, a product owner or a, a stakeholder or a business analyst can help us with. Um, the other really big point for me is it doesn't have to be automated to provide value. That's really, really important. When we talk about acceptance tests, when we talk about automated acceptance tests, this is where it becomes important. Um, so where does this kind of fit in? Uh, this is Martin Fowler's pyramid of like wh what he thinks our composition of tests should be. 70% of this is going to be unit tests, and 20% is integration tests. That's things that touch multiple layers. And right here up at the top is automated acceptance tests, 10%. I throw this up here only to point out automated acceptance testing is great for a certain set of things, but it is not a silver bullet that will solve all of our problems, and it does not take the place of unit or integration testing. It's something that complements and adds to the richness of our, of our software quality. 
If you want to think of it this way, unit testing is kind of like a scalpel, and uh, integration testing is kind of like a steak knife, you know, or integration testing is the steak knife. So if it's the scalpel and the steak knife, then like automated acceptance testing is really kind of like this <laughs> massive chainsaw. It cuts through a lot of stuff, but it's really not so great for like fine-grained things, right? Does that make sense to folks? Cool. All right. Um, so automated acceptance testing, great for covering lots of ground, not so good for <laughs> specifying very, very, very specific things. So how do we get started? Um, there's a couple of popular frameworks. The one we're going to talk about here is Cucumber. Uh, Cucumber is probably the most popular one in this space. Um, and if you come from different places, you know, this is a polygot sort of place. So uh, there's lots of different options. If you're using J uh, Java, you've got uh, Cucumber JVM or JVHave. Uh, in Ruby, you've got uh, Cucumber Ruby. Ruby on Rails has a separate one for Cucumber Rails. Uh, Node.js and JavaScript, you have Cucumber JavaScript, or interestingly, if you're in the Angular frameworks, they have uh, Protractor. But I want to make a point here, Protractor is not the same, it's a different sort of framework. Um, so all the rest of these are Cucumber based, but Protractor, Protractor is different from those. It uses a different, uh, a different style. Um, Does it do the same thing? Sort of. Uh, yes, more or less. Uh, at the end of the day, they both run <coughs> Selenium which will hit your web browser and will uh, exercise your website. Um, the way in which they accomplish that is different. Um, so, a good question though, it's uh, very, very important. Uh, C-sharp, it's interesting because it's not a cucumber name, it's specflow, <coughs> um, and Python is behave. Okay, hopefully that covers all the languages you guys might be using here. Uh, if not, come see me after. <laughs> You're still using, I, I guess, maybe like um, Pascal or something strange. Um, <laughs> okay. So good news for all of us. There's a lot of options, but at the end of the day, Cucumber syntax is the same in basically any language that we're going to do this in. So with that, uh, nice examples will be in Python. That's where I'm coming from. But understand that uh, all of this stuff should be basically the same, maybe a couple of tweaks to make it more like the, the syntax of that language, but it should all basically be the same. And everything that I show here tonight should be uh, doable in all of these languages. So nobody should feel left out. Um, so let's get started. Um, oops. One of the things I wanted to talk about with this was, I thought about lots of different examples and lots of cool language features that I wanted to show you guys. and Lots of really interesting things we could do. But at the end of the day, it's, it's confusing to show lots of disparate examples. I wanted to, to take a problem and just sort of solve it from start to finish. Because I think that reflects more about how we learn and how we tend to approach these problems. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have one problem, and we're going to work it all the way through. So it's nice learning objectives. So if you walk out of here and you know these things, you'll be in good shape. Um, basically, what I want to do is have us write an, uh, an acceptance test. I want us to automate that using Selenium. And then I want us to incorporate that into a continuous integration server. This last point is really important to me. I see so many demonstrations and presentations where it's like, cool, it's running on your laptop, good luck. And nobody talks about, well, how do I bring this to a professional environment? How do I put this into the thing that I need? Um, we will most likely, in a professional context, want to put this in continuous integration. So I didn't want to leave that out. So we'll, we'll talk about getting that. Um, that also means, though, that this will have to stay a little bit high level. Maybe at a different time, we can go much more in depth. Uh, if you have questions, you can definitely talk to me after. But uh, we're going to keep it kind of high level. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, cool. We've set the ground rules. Let's talk about an example. This is going to be our example. This is a lovely website called thecatapi.com. Uh, has anybody ever been here? Uh, yep. OK, Lucas is apparently the only one. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, so, so basically, it's a website that uh, it has an API in the back end. And the idea is that it shows you a random cat picture pulled up from Tumblr. Um, and then there's a couple of basic functionalities. Again, it's an API. You can use it. Um, and let's say that we were charged with testing this website, OK? because we work in a really cool place that builds this stuff. So our objective for tonight, we want to test the upvote and the downvote functionality. So if you look on this page, um, you'll see there's a love it and a hate it button. So that's the up and down voting. Um, yeah, so we're going to test that functionality. Uh, I'm going to show lots of examples and stuff like that. Don't worry about writing it down. Uh, I have a GitHub repository in case this is something that you guys want to see. And I'll uh, include this with like the slide presentation and all that stuff. So uh, this will be available if you want to check it out, deploy it, you know, the download, do, do your own stuff. Um, 
Okay. Step one, write an acceptance test. Great. So we've got to do a little bit of project setup for this. Um, basically, you're going to download and install Cucumber of your choice, whatever language you're using, and then we're going to set up a basic directory structure. So what we'll have is a project root, and then uh, a features directory, and then steps inside of that and pages. So two directory steps and pages. We'll talk about those later. Um, but this is the general structure we want to set up. <coughs> so let's talk about Cucumber and how it's structured. Uh, Cucumber has three layers, uh, if you will. Uh, there's sort of the gherkin or the feature layer at the top. There's a glue layer or a step implementation in the middle. And then at the very bottom is running Selenium code. Okay? Um, we're going to first talk about this gherkin feature level. All right? So, uh, what is gherkin? So you'll hear me, whenever I talk about feature files, what I'm referring to is like this gherkin syntax. It's, uh, I use those terms interchangeably. It's basically human readable syntax describing the test. And it's really nice and concise and, and enjoyable. Um, it consists of a main feature, so just the thing that I'm trying to test, and then several scenarios that are describing what I'm, what I'm actually testing. Uh, so let me give an example here. Uh, so this is the general structure. You'll see up here uh, a feature, and then a little description. So as a role, I want to do some kind of feature so that I can have some kind of a benefit. Um, anybody who's you know, worked in Scrum or done Agile work will probably recognize this as a user story. So you can actually take this and dump your user stories in here. Uh, and that's great. <laughs> then we have a scenario. And in each scenario, you'll notice three keywords, given, when, and then. So given is your sort of uh, your setup or your preconditions, things you want to be in place before you run your action or you do any kind of testing. Your when is going to be what you're actually testing, so whatever event you want to trigger. Um, and then your then is your sort of assertion or your, you know, whatever your expected outcome is. Does that make sense to folks? Um, I'll show this as an example. So, uh, yep. So here is uh, a sample feature file. Can you guys read that in the back there? OK. Uh, here's a sample feature file that we wrote for the CAD API. Basically, uh, as a CAD enthusiast, I want to be able to upload pictures I like so that, I, uh, so that the website will continue to show me cute cats. <laughs> a sample story doesn't really, probably not the best written, but uh, for the purposes of an example, sets up kind of what we want to test and the scope of what we're trying to do. And then we might have a scenario. So it'll say, OK, given that I'm on the CAD API, homepage, when I click Love It, a new CAD image should be loaded onto the page. This is a very concise, simple, straightforward test, right? So let's talk about some observations there. It's very, very straightforward, and you can see that it has value even if it's not automated. What I mean is, if I gave this test to somebody in the room, and I said, OK, here's the URL, run this test. Do you guys think you could run that? Like, it's straightforward, simple. Makes sense, right? Okay. Um, it's also really developer friendly, and this is the main reason that I like it. If a product owner or a business analyst hands me something like this as a developer and says, at the end of the story, if you run these tests and you, you know, pass all of these, I, I'm okay with this, then it's really easy as a developer. Great, I just have to make sure all these things pass. That's wonderful. That's really clear. And it's, it provides good value to me so that I know exactly what I'm expecting. It's also not extremely specific. So you'll notice that like, when I talk about like, well, what does it mean for a new cat image to be loaded? Like, what is that? It's not saying, in the div with the ID of main cat image, it should say, or it should, you know, it's not, it's not developer specific. And that's really important. We get into this conversation about, they call it the declarative versus the imperative style. And in imperative style, it's like, well, it should be this. And it has, you know, it is this button on this page and this div and this ID. Like, it's very, very specific. If we're declarative, it's like, well, OK, this is the general functionality I'm looking for. And I'm trying to be, you know, I'm trying to decouple whatever my feature is from its actual implementation. Does that make sense to folks? So I, I don't want those things to be tied because maybe the implementation changes and whatnot. Um, so my advice is sort of try not to get bogged down in precision versus verboseness. Now, the caveat to that, of course, is like, in reality, we have to know what it does. So you can't abstract it too much, right? Like, at the end of the day, it has to make sense. But um, try not to make this something where it's like super precise with lots and lots of conditions and stuff. A good example is if you go to Google, right? I was running a test for that. I'd say like, 
when I uh, click on, and when I type in, uh, you know, when I search for uh, cats, right? That makes sense, that's declarative. Versus when I type in cats in the search bar and I click the search button. Does that make sense to folks? Like the difference between those two? It's also a lot easier to write, you know? So, great. We've written our acceptance tests. That was pretty straightforward. Let's go to step two and let's actually automate this. This is where the, the rubber meets the road. So if you remember our three layers, we just talked about this, this top one here, this Gherkin feature level. Now we're gonna talk about the glue step, uh, the, the glue code, okay? First, we gotta do a little bit of project setup. So we have to create an environment file. And the idea is that this is sort of your, uh, if you've ever worked with a testing framework before, this is sort of your introduction. Like this is where all of the uh, before you know, conditions and after conditions go. This is where you set up your project, that sort of thing. Um, so that's what sets up the test runner. Uh, you can also create a configuration file. This is sort of a best practice. You may have lots of things that you want to be able to change and you don't want those hard coded in your environment file. So it makes sense to abstract that into some kind of a configuration, properties, text, whatever. Uh, something of that nature that you'll be in later. Um, lastly, we're going to create a steps.py file. Uh, this is just your step runner. So a place where we will put step definitions in the, the basically that glue code. Okay. Let's uh, step through those things one at a time. First, environment.py. So this is, again, where my test runner gets set up. Um, if you've used any testing framework, this may look familiar. So before all and after all, before feature, after feature, before scenario, after scenario. Um, these things will run at certain times, depending on what you want to do. Um, and there's a lot of code we can put in this, but really it depends on how your environment is set up, what types of things you want to accomplish. Um, I've included a full example here in, in, in uh, the GitHub repository. So if you want to see like what that actually looks like, uh, what's, you know, what a typical setup would be, you can go there. But I, I don't think it's, it would take a lot of time to go through that particular stuff. Okay? So like what type of stuff would we put in there? Um, we would set up Selenium, right? So this is where we initialize our web driver. So, okay, uh, we can, so Selenium itself does not come with anything uh, that would run, you have to set up a very specific, like, okay, I want to run with this browser. And there are, the browser providers uh, create drivers for Selenium. So there's like Chrome driver or PhantomJS or even something like Sauce Labs. Uh, that's what we would set up there. <clears throat> you might also want to set up like a logger. So maybe you have Log4j or uh, something like that. So you can uh, log some things to the console or maybe to a log file as you run your tests. Um, you may want to initialize a context object. So the context object allows us to pass information uh, between various steps and things like that. And you might also just want to set some defaults. Again, this is where that configuration file comes into place. So I'm pulling in defaults and uh, either overriding them or, or not. Does this make sense to folks, like what you would put into an environment.py file? Okay. So let's talk about glue code. Uh, so we've, we've set things up. We've got our environment ready to go. And what the glue code is basically going to do is parse each line of Gherkin, right? Individually parsing each line, and then it's going to try and look for a corresponding step that matches that. So if you see here, I've got home.feature has this line given I'm on the cat API's home page. And then in my steps file, I'm going to have an, a decorator that has a matching you know, phrase there, so it has to be an exact match. Um, and then it's just a, a method that implements that. So does that make sense to folks, like how those things are tied together? It's going to basically pull out each line and then search for a corresponding you know, method that matches that. Okay? That's, that's kind of where the magic happens. People, people have trouble figuring out like, where does it all fit together. So let's take a look at an example here. Um, just like our, our sample feature file that we had, I just have these three steps. So given I'm on the Cat APIs homepage, I have a step for the homepage. Uh, this is, again, it's entirely your implementation specific. So in this case, I just have something that goes to the page, and then I store the initial cat image uh, from, the, from the page. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how that's implemented, but for now, we should be able to kind of read this just, you know, I don't really know how it's implemented, but maybe we follow along. Um, we have a when, so when I click love it, we have, uh, it will go and it will get the love it button, and then it will click on it. Last, we have our assertion, right? So a new cat image should be loaded on the page. So we're going to wait for the page to reload, and then we're going to assert that the initial cat image is not the current cat image. Does that make sense to folks, like conceptually, like what we're doing? Um, 
the rule of thumb I try and use here is that this should be written at a level that's sort of like junior level programming. We don't want to put a tremendous amount of logic in our glue code because it can get complicated. We want to try and abstract as much of that away as we can um, so that it's reusable and it's simple. Um, glue code is also a really great place to introduce folks who are you know, junior developers on the project to testing and stuff, so it's a good place for them to kind of work. And if we write good abstractions and we kind of keep things out, it'll be good. Yes. So, so you kind of use the Gherkin part as the com as doing comments mm -hmm. on the code for the, the second part. Precisely. Okay. So like so the aspiration is somebody should be able to read this and say like, okay, I get it. This is the implementation, um, and they should be able to peruse this stuff easily. Again, with all testing code, we want to make sure that it's as simple as we can. You know, so it's easy to follow. So we don't have to write tests for our testing code. Does that make sense? Question? What, what happens if the Gherkin changes? Do you have to change the exact strings in here as well? Yes, and that's one of the downsides of this. So like, you know, we try not to, uh, I mean, we try really hard not to do a lot of like, you know, wordsmithing and rearranging. Uh, typically we, we settle on like a vocabulary or a way of describing things. Um, one other feature that's nice here is you can put multiple annotations in. So if there's like simple English grammatical stuff, so the difference between saying like, uh, the page and a page, or something like that. You can do those and have the same implementation. Does that make sense? Yes? That would be a multiple whens. So what will happen is you have uh, an and, and so you'll just mark it with the, uh, you'll mark it with the when uh, annotation, but that's perfectly allowed. It's probably not great practice if you have lots of ones, but sometimes it's, un it's, uh, it's unavoidable. And the same goes for the other steps as well. So if you have multiple things to set up in your given, so I go to the page and uh, I'm, you know, I log in as so and so, and I, you know, those types of things, it's uh, it's perfectly acceptable in Gherkin to just put the and operator there, and it recognizes that as with the given. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. So you just put an and right as an annotation to another step. Uh, no, 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 no. So um, if I have two things that are uh, like oh. If I have two things that are uh, a given step, right? So it'll say, you know, given I am on the home page and uh, I have, you know, done X, Y, Z. Those are two individual steps, right? But they're both, even if it uh, starts with and, uh, it will be marked with the, you know, whatever the top level thing is there. So it'll be marked with given in that case. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, other questions before I move on? With, uh, yes. Uh, spec flow. Uh, when we did an AAT implementation, we were able to parameterize our Gherkin. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, if you change your Gherkin uh, along those uh, uh, parameters, it, it would dynamically execute something, something different. Yes, and that's an excellent point. So, like, this is not, you know, it's not perfectly static. So, for example, one <coughs> thing I could do is I could, uh, I could uh, make a parameter out of the I click the whatever button, you know, uh, and then. Uh, you can do some advanced things where it's like, okay, it'll pass that in as a parameter, and it can handle more than one thing, different words, um, and that's very, very common. It's it's a good idea because you want to be able, to, obviously, you want to be able to test, you know, lots of different examples without having to write more and more code. So that is a possibility. Um, okay. Uh, some observations about this, right? So we're making references to context. Um, the context object is like uh, the way we pass information back and forth between stuff. So. Uh, just to point out, here I'm tossing in an object into uh, context, right? This initial cat image source. And then I'm using it at a later step. That's, that's what the context object is there for. I want to be able to take things from one side, from one step and you know, use that information in another. Otherwise, it would be really, really hard to implement this stuff. So the context allows us to keep information across. Um, second observation, what in the world is this like home thing? Like, and why do we go to it? That sort of thing. So, one abstraction that we like is this idea of a uh, page object model. The idea is we want to build a page that represents this stuff. We want to build an object that represents uh, a specific page. Okay, I'll talk a little about that in a second. So that's pretty much the glue code. Now we're going to talk about Selenium, right? This is where the rubber really meets. This is like where the, the magic actually happens. So. Uh, in my diagram, I kind of show this as like the glue step and then like one giant Selenium class. That's really not a great practice. You can do it, you know, but it gets really unwieldy really fast. You have lots and lots of methods, and it's really you know, cumbersome and difficult to deal with. Programmers are better. We like to abstract things. 
This is the preferred way of doing that, is this page object model. So we have like a base page that will have, you know, any of our common functions and things like that. And then we have a home page and a docs page and a reference page and whatever else is there, but pages that represent that. And uh, those things encapsulate all the information on those pages. Um, they might also have some utility functions, things like that that are used between those. Um, so what exactly would we put into a page object? So let's take a look at our home page again. So this is the page we're testing, right? And you notice it has a couple of key important things on it, right? Like a like it button, a hate it button, you got a title, you got a main image, you know, other stuff like that. Um, it's important when we build these things that we kind of know and understand what they are as developers. So when we're running our page, what we'll basically do is create an element for each of these, a page, a page element for it. We'll mark down what its selector is, so some way of uniquely identifying that thing. So okay, it's got an ID, or it's got a CSS selector, or an XPath, or something like that that I can use to grab that. We'll create a get method for it. So, you know, I have uh, the, the like it button, I want to create a way of getting the like it button, so I can do stuff to it, like click it. Um, oops. And then also any like other commonly used attributes. Uh, the, the best example here is like uh, the image files, or images, uh, you might have a source, right? It would be common for us to reference that, or it's width and height maybe. Um, so we would maybe want to create, uh, create a convenience method for us to grab that information so we're not duplicating lots of code there. We also want to define navigation to the page. So uh, we want to be able to know how to get there. The anti-pattern that I see a lot of times is like you just put in the reference to the URL and it goes there, but then you have that copied a whole bunch of times and what if that changes, what if that gets updated, whatever. We just want to be able to provide a simple way of navigating that page if possible. And lastly, any kind of like helpers or uh, actions that we want to do, this is typically like waiting for things or storing special information, that kind of stuff. So you know, if a page does something and I want to wait for an action to occur, then you, you would toss in a helper method there. So let's see that in practice. So just like we talked about, this is an example of a, of a uh, page object. Simple enough, right? Uh, you've got constants at the top that represent its IDs, or it's um, how I would select that stuff, so whatever my selector is. You've got navigation, so how do I get there? And then you've got get methods. So a way to get the button, uh, a way to get the cat image, yeah, a way to get the cat image source, like that sort of stuff. Uh, again, this is specific to how you want to code it and how you want to put it in. This is just an example. Um, your mileage may vary. Does this make sense to folks? Do I need to clarify? So, one more small detail that we have not talked about yet. Um, we need to set up the web driver. We never actually did that, and I never showed anything like that. So, uh, the one that I usually recommend is Chrome Driver. It works great, it's well supported, like Selenium endorses it, that sort of thing. If you want to use Chrome Driver, there's a link to get it downloaded. All you have to do is, in your before all, you just put this like webdriver.chrome, and then you hit the path. Um, Something like that, depending on your language, but uh, it should be very, very straightforward. And now you have a driver object that you can use for Selenium to make calls, to get things, that sort of stuff. And you can pass these into your page object models to use. So this is how the page object model actually references things on the page. Does that make sense? Cool. So that, that, step, that step is very straightforward. But let's, let's see this in action. So we talked about how to put all this together, but let's actually see this go. Okay. Let's hook this. So here I have my tests. Uh, again, this is just a clone of that repository that I that I built for us. Uh, and in the Java world and in the uh, Python world, uh, we just have a command behave. It will search out all of my feature files and try to implement them. So this is what that looks like. Now don't blink; it may go very fast. So here's the window. It's going to open up the catapi.com. Loads cat image. Waits for it to go, and it's gone. Let me show that one more time because. It's, it's uh, quick. So again, goes there, clicks the button, waits to see if there's a new image, and then closes the window. Very fast, very speedy, and we're not doing any kind of like, we're only waiting for just long enough for it to recognize there's a new image there. Which button are you clicking? The like it button. The like it? Mm-hmm. All right, so you're ruining their whole system. Exactly. <laughs> so, so apparently there's a whole bunch of random cat images that are going to be... <laughs> so, uh, have, have fun with that. <laughs> That's the database. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Um, any questions on that, on that demonstration, like what that was doing, what that looks like, how you run it, that sort of stuff, before I move on?
There was some warning in Chrome. Uh, is that which one here? No, when you ran Chrome, there was. Uh, oh yeah. So I'm not entirely sure why Selenium does this, but there's some like command that it's running, and it, and it picks up as like some argument that's not being set or some argument. There's something that it's like ignoring certificates or something like that. So if your plan is to test certificates, maybe it's not the best choice for that, but um, for most other things, I think it's it's appropriate. And and we can talk about other ways of testing that don't don't involve that. Uh, so this is really good for local development testing. Uh, but all right, so that's really cool. You can run this locally, maybe go. But you're professionals. I'm going to put this in a real professional context. How do we do this? So let's recap real quick. Um, page object model organizes our code. Uh, write simple reusable methods so that we kind of, you know, we can implement the pages simply. Lots of, uh, we avoid reuse of uh, stuff. You can, not, you can see how that could really easily get, you know, out of control and become maintenance headache. So reuse uh, as much as you can. And last, uh, we install Chrome driver. Very simple, very straightforward. <coughs> Let's talk about continuous integration. So now we have these tests. Why would we want to put this in continuous integration? Well, because we have uh, a site that might be up and running, and we want to test it and make sure that it's still functioning properly. Or we've made a deployment to the website, and we want to make sure that it you know, functions after we've done our deployment. Or we want to ensure that anything that's new that we deploy doesn't break something that's old. So think of it this way. I want to make sure the stuff you know, that's the same still works. I want to make sure the stuff that's new works. And I want to make sure that the new stuff doesn't break the old stuff. Does that make sense? So one of the problems we're running into is if I am doing this locally, I can use Chrome. But what happens when I have Jenkins or something like that running in an instance of AWS? You basically have a server somewhere that's doing RCI, and you only have a command line input to it. It does not have Chrome installed. And we don't have any kind of browser there. So like, what do you do with that? Do I have to tell all my system administrators like it has to now be a you know uh, a version that has a GUI? No, we don't need that. So one way of solving this problem is people try using Phantom JS, and it works you know for for some stuff. Uh, it's a headless browser, so that means there's no GUI or, or anything like that. It's not rendering to the screen. Um, it's based on WebKit, so you know it's a good web standard. Um, and it's fast because it's not actually rendering anything to the page. It's kind of simulating what would go on when, during rendering. It's, uh, it's beneficial there. And it works with Selenium. That's great. Here's the downside. It's kind of a black box. This is a big problem when you're testing because Selenium is really finicky. Um, what happens is you'll get this weird error and you don't know why and you're trying to troubleshoot it. And it's like, well, I can't really see what's going on, so what does that mean? Like, you know, I, I don't understand. That's a problem, and that can be really frustrating when Chrome works, but PhantomJS doesn't. So PhantomJS also has problems with some, some features. Things like alerts don't seem to work so well, and that's a big challenge, right? We still work with websites that use that functionality or have things that will, will uh, render, you know, to, like it opens a new, uh, new uh, window. You know, this can be a challenge for, for, uh, for PhantomJS because, again, it's a headless browser. It has no concept of, like, other windows and things like that. So that's a challenge. Um, it's also a bit buggy. I haven't used it in a bit, but the the experience was not great with it. So at this point in time, like I really don't recommend it at all. Um, it's it seems like a great idea, but we just have to give it some time. A better solution might be to use something like Sauce Labs. So this is why I like Sauce Labs. What it basically does is it creates these things called uh, cloudified browsers. It's basically going to spin up a bunch of uh, browsers in the cloud for you. So you have your instance of Selenium, and it's running. And it reaches into the cloud at Sauce Labs and grabs whatever browser it needs to. And then it takes that and uses those to run against your website. So we're able to create a connection to something in the cloud that then runs against our, our server. The advantage here is that uh, we can test different browsers and different operating system configurations. Uh, I really like the idea that I don't have to keep an old version of like some Windows laptop with you know Internet Explorer 8 and you know Windows XP in a drawer somewhere that's going to be a, a vulnerability on my network. You know I don't have to keep that hardware around in order to have that test. I just say you know Sauce Labs can be one of those things. Um, so that's really awesome. Also, it has integration with a lot of RCI tools. So if you use Jenkins or Travis or Circle CI or Bamboo or uh, Team City, it works with all of those things. So they've done a really great job on integration. Lastly, uh, and this is my favorite, it has the video recording and playback. 
So if there's ever a problem where it's running, you can actually go back and see it. So I had a problem uh, a while ago where uh, our test started failing for some reason. I didn't really understand why. And I was able to go into the video playback and look at that. And it was like, oh, the browser is opening up in a very, very small viewport, like a very small size. And it's throwing the website into our mobile friendly mode, right? So it was, you know, our responsive web API was like, nope, I'm going to shrink this down. And the tests were failing. We wouldn't be able to see that in Phantom JS, but we were because we were able to play the video feedback. So that was really nice. And it's helpful. Um, so you're probably like, that's cool, but like this whole cloud server thing, you have to, it's not inside my network, so now what about testing like my dev servers, or what about testing like my stuff inside of my network? I can only test things that are available to the public, right? Well, no. Sauce can actually uh, help with that. So Sauce has this thing called Sauce Connect, and it allows us to create a tunnel to our servers. So here's what happens. Um, you spin up a Sauce Connect tunnel, inside of your, you know, on your uh, Jenkins server or your local development environment or wherever you're running this from. And it will create a tunnel to uh, Sauce Labs. Sauce Labs will then use that tunnel to, uh, to access, you know, your network. So the idea is that anything that my server can access, I should be able to access with Sauce Labs, right? So it's creating a, a tunnel with which it sends all of its traffic. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. Uh, this is, I swear it's a lot easier to set up than it is to explain. Um, so how do I, how do I get that working? What yep. about um, like PII type of information that it might have access to, you know, social security numbers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, are they secure enough for that? Are they certified? Because uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. work with the federal government. So my understanding is that it's a, it's a, uh, it's definitely like an encrypted and secure tunnel. So it has like end-to-end -end encryption and that sort of thing. I don't know about certifications. Um, that might be something you can find at like Sauce Labs, you know, uh, website, that sort of thing. Um, but it is a secure tunnel. And when we get the question about security, a lot of times what we explain is that we're spinning up the tunnel just uh, for the duration of like uh, the duration of the test. So it's not a persistent tunnel that we've left open this entire time. And it's, you know, it's based on like an access key that only the server has, like there's some protections in place. So it's not like I'm just exposing, you know, a tunnel that lets any traffic go through. It's a very specific and it's tied specifically to Sauce Labs. So, yeah. Does that answer your question, Don? Yeah. Cool. All right. So how do we set this thing up? Um, it's pretty straightforward. You go to Sauce Labs, you sign up for, you sign up for an account, um, and then you get an API key. That's basically it. Um, You'll need to modify your environment.py in order to accommodate this. So we're going to, instead of having it uh, launch a Chrome driver, we're going to launch the Sauce Labs driver instead. Um, again, Selenium allows us to swap these things out. They're the same, uh, but it's a little more work. So we have to be able to provide the, uh, the username and the API key, but then we also have to be able to sell, tell it which browser and operating system to use. So the setup is a little more uh, complicated. Here's what that looks like. Um, and here at the top, I've got your Sauce config. I basically just provide the username and the Sauce key. Uh, a best practice here is not to put this in your source code. Uh, it's to grab it from the uh, is to grab it from the environment variables, and then if you put it into continuous integration, you can just inject those things in. Um, and then here, all we're doing is we're creating a remote web driver with you know the the configuration for the browser we want, and then we're uh, connecting to Sauce. This is all copied from their their website. You know they just say drop this code in place. Uh, and again, I also have a link to this if you want to see what that looks like in actual code. All right. Uh, the other thing we have to set up desired capabilities. This is just kind of telling it what browser to use and what operating system to use and what version. So uh, platform, you know, we set a default uh, browser and version. Does this make sense to folks? This is the only two things you have to change in your environment.py, and now we can run with Sauce. Is it possible to say some like latest version? Yes. Uh, well, I think they have. I think they have options for like the development versions of stuff, or like the the uh, trunk version, of, or like uh, I don't know about like last stable. Um, it should be. It, it really doesn't often matter that much with like the latest versions, but you know it's something that could be configured at least. So there's ways forward. Um, okay, let's do a demo. So what I have stood up is an instance of Jenkins running on my on my local machine. So. Go here. So this is my instance of Jenkins. Can you guys can you guys see that in the back? If I can stretch this out a little bit. There we go. Um, and I have a, a simple job here. This is my Cat API browser test. 
I'm going to go in here and I'm going to configure it. Uh, who here has worked with Jenkins before? Like, show of hands? Okay, sweet. So, if you haven't worked with Jenkins before, um, basically it's just a job, it's a tool that allows us to run jobs and automate things, uh, and we can set those jobs up. Um, it'll start by creating like a workspace for you, and that workspace will just clone uh, the repository that I created. So it'll clone my browser tests into a workspace. And then we can do stuff with that workspace uh, in the actual execution uh, phase of things. So down here, there's a plugin you can install for Jenkins for Sauce On Demand. So you just check this box, and it'll give you all of these options. So I want to enable Sauce Connect. That basically says, I would like to spin up a tunnel, and it will take care of all that work for you. Here we can select what version of WebDriver we want to use. So like, hey, I want to use, so like there's your, you know, the beta and the dev version and the latest version of Windows and Chrome, that sort of thing. So I'm going to specify those. And then a little further down, um, you can also, under the Advanced tab, you can specify the name of the tunnel. And that's useful. We'll need to do that in order to get it to actually, so we know what tunnel we're using. And here we have just basically a, a nice simple script. So all this does is copy my sauce environment file configuration over. So this is where those config files are useful. So copies it over into where I'm expecting my configuration file. In the Python world, we like to create virtual environments. So all of this code here just creates a virtual environment and installs uh, some requirements. So like behave and selenium and those things. Um, again, your, your mileage may vary on this depending on your language, but some way of installing dependencies. Um, then all we have to do is we have two lines for exporting, you know, so injecting those variables in. Obviously, this is not the best practice to put your sauce key there. Um, you can set this up in the administration so that it's like protected or injected in as a password so that it's not exposed there in clear text. Uh, but for the purposes of a demo, I just toss it there. And then we just call behave like we called uh, before when we were testing it locally. I uh, told it to spit out some JUnit results and dump that to a test directory. Does this make sense to folks? So it's essentially the same configuration. The only thing we really changed here is we're telling it to use Sauce, and we're using the Sauce plugin here. Okay, let's run this. Is, is virtual env like a Docker? So in, in the Python world, the idea is uh, we want to be able to isolate the things that we've installed. So all the little packages and things like that. Um, it's similar to like, uh, it's a package manager. So the idea is we create a, a wrapper around it that says, you know, uh, don't install these things globally, just install them locally in this space. Does that make sense? Okay. So then where are you actually, are you actually deploying the site? No. Somewhere? So uh, I'm assuming the website is already up and running. And usually when you write these sort of test steps, the deployment and the like, browser testing step are decoupled. So you'd want to have one, step that, or one job that uh, deploys it, and then the following job uh, would test it. And you orchestrate them through like a uh, build flow or uh, upstream downstream job, that sort of thing. So in Jenkins, you'd actually have a separate project for the integration test. Correct. So a separate job, but yes. So all of them underneath of the whatever your project is, but you know a separate job that runs that that uh, stuff. Separate job. Yes. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's run it. Let's see the magic in action. So I promise this is really the only time that I'll be showing lots of console output. Um, don't be overwhelmed. I'll point out the part that's exciting. Um, <laughs> so, also, um, yeah, because it, it prints out a lot of stuff. Um, the other thing is this spinning up the tunnel does take time. Uh, so there are options for like optimizing this and making it better. And um, if you have multiple jobs that are using the same tunnel, uh, so you have you know projects, it will actually recognize if one one tunnel is open, and then uh, it'll just say okay you know, use that existing tunnel and then uh, uh, close it when both jobs are finished. So, yeah, it'll take a little bit to get that to go. Um, Do you have terse and verbose options for that? Yes, so for the tunnel, you can set it to be like uh, verbose, you know, output in case you're like trying to debug a connection problem. Uh, so there's verbose options there. Uh, and in Selenium, you can also, uh, you can set up your logger to be like verbose or debug or, uh, or sorry, debug or info or or error or whatever. So uh, you can set log level style messages there. Okay. So it's running now, and again, it's giving me the same output that it was showing on the screen. I fed in some info statements and things like that just for uh, my own sanity. Wait for this to finish. 
So here is really kind of, it's a little messy, but here is our thing running, right? So given I'm on the Cat APIs homepage, when I click the love it button, then the Cat APIs should be loaded. Great. It works. It goes. You know, it, it functions. But what? This one? Yeah, the video URL right there. Should just play right there. No, no. So actually, so you want to see the video, right? That's actually where I'd like to take us. So um, this will create a link to a job in Sauce Labs. So it's run, and we can see like in Jenkins that that job is, has completed. It, it dumps out the JUnit files and stuff. But what Sauce Labs gives us is you know some information about the commands that it ran. But the screencast is the one that I like. So here is a working version of it going. So this is exactly what the browser, or what the the server saw when it ran this thing. So. There it goes. Click the love it button. Wait for a second. It usually shows the end of it. Sometimes it can be a little uh, finicky the first time you load it. Come on. Yeah. There we go. So it's working. It, you can see it go. Um, again, if you have a lot longer of tests, this is really useful. So it's like, hey. About halfway through, it failed on like this one step. What was going on? And you find that it's in mobile mode or some really strange like condition. Um, that's really super helpful. Other things like the Selenium log in case maybe your connection dies or something strange goes on. Um, that's helpful. Yes. So then, do you here what you have is you have one repo that essentially has all your tests, mm -hmm. but it's a separate repo from where the site is. Is that typically how you would do it in a production environment? No. You typically. would actually keep it in all one repo? Correct, yeah. So you have your testing repo with your unit tests and your integration tests and then your browser tests and whatnot. Uh, the setup there is, you know, uh, it, it's fine to keep those things in that same list and probably a good idea because, again, there's value in those like feature files where it's like, hey, what exactly does the application do? You know, it's a good way to kind of introduce people to the concepts of like, what is the application, what is it for, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's, it's perfectly okay to keep those there. Uh, other questions before I move on? This is pretty much how Selenium works, how Chrome, uh, how um, Sauce Connect works. Okay. One last topic I want to cover. So, so I need to be honest about limitations here, right? Automatic sequence testing is great and can be very powerful, but it has limitations. It can really only test what's available through the browser. And that means if you're trying to test something very specific, like a data condition or things like that, whatever the user can see, it can usually test. But sometimes, you know, there's other things. So again, it's not a substitution for integration or unit testing. Uh, and sometimes those are better fits for that. Also, Selenium really can be painful at times. The biggest thing that happens with most people who are new to this is Selenium runs too fast. So it doesn't wait for stuff to load, it doesn't you know, do the normal things that human beings do. We need to actually tell it to explicitly wait for stuff. Waiting, so for example, when running that, we have to tell it to explicitly wait for the next image to show up because it might actually kind of go through. It might go through too quickly and fail the test. Okay? Also, debugging can be kind of hard in those conditions. So uh, good logging and things like that are really important so you know what's going on, so you understand what's going on and what it's trying to accomplish. Also, let's talk about the elephant in the room, and that's like data. So if you have a really, really data-heavy application, this may not be a great choice for that. It's not impossible, but it is more complicated. So things like user workflow management and uh, user, like uh, anywhere where you have like lots of um, user content being uploaded, that sort of stuff where you have you know, uh, data being uh, dumped in and you have no control over it, those, those can get tricky. Um, sometimes what we'll do with this is we'll launch a test server and then maybe what we'll do is we'll have a, uh, a test fixture that loads it. So that way we have a reliable set of data that we're running it up against. Another option for this is to create sort of a testing mode. So the idea is the browser will fire off a request that just you know, hits an API and says, hey, Throw this thing into testing mode for this user and don't commit any of its transactions. Then roll all the stuff back. So if you have situations where I wouldn't want to, I want to test a you know, production-like server, but I don't really want to commit a bunch of test data, that might be helpful. But this does involve a lot of rework of your own code. So it's not free and it's uh, not, not the easiest thing to put in. But it can be done. Also, 
sometimes that stuff is just better covered by integration tests. So I'm looking for a very specific you know, condition that I want to throw, maybe write an integration test for that, and save uh, the browser navigation and things like that for, for uh, AAT. Uh, with that, uh, here are a couple of resources. So like, there's a link to the repo. Uh, there is uh, cucumber.info is the Gherkin stuff. Uh, so all of the like Gherkin framework and how to set it up, all the languages. Um, there's a great thing for behave examples. So uh, that was the, the, the uh, thing we're using here in Python. So if you want to see that, uh, you know, if you want to use that, and there's a lot of great examples there. Uh, and then also the Sauce Labs references. Um, questions? In the back. You, you have the top 10 OWASP uh, weaknesses, and you have the common weakness enumerations and stuff. Mm -hmm. can, can you do some of that vulnerability testing in this? Yes. Framework? So there's actually a really interesting project called BDD Security. And the I'm idea sorry, is BD? BDD Security. Uh -huh. um, and uh, this is a fairly new thing, uh, but it's really fascinating. They're using uh, Gherkin to sort of drive this stuff forward. And it'll say, like, uh, I go to the page, and if there are any input boxes, I try, you know, cross-site scripting on them. And it will literally run some <laughs> stuff in the background. And uh, it's really fascinating and cool. So uh, that's a very interesting use for it. Um, but also a good way to kind of crawl your website for stuff. Um, but it does, it does take a lot of setup, and it's not, not the, the most friendly thing to work with. But it is an interesting project. BDD stands for? Uh, business, yeah, behavior-driven development. Yeah. A little add-on to that with just one more thing. Um, we're actually having a, uh, a series of sessions here um, to go through the OWASP top 10 and uh, talk about how people can use the, uh, the top 10 attacks against your website or application. So the first class of that is here on, I believe, March 25th. Is it during the day? No, it's after. It's another week up. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So if you want to practice that stuff, like, and you want to know, like, how to do this, and um, that's definitely a good place to learn. Uh, yes? I just want to add on, uh, Lucas did a presentation the other week about a, another tool called Gauntlet, and mm -hmm. it will actually run all of your like attack scenarios in like in Gherkin, mm -hmm. where your steps are basically just like different penetration testing steps. So, um, it's yep. pretty cool that the documentation. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to do a follow-up question. Do you have any tips on getting your uh, your projects to pay for sauce labs. Ah, any tips on convincing them to pay for sauce labs? Okay, <laughs> let's see. So, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so uh, sauce labs can be so sauce labs can be slow. So uh, the biggest piece of advice that I have is like work out all the places where you are uh, implicitly waiting for stuff. So you're like, okay, wait for five seconds because I don't know why, and then keep going. Find ways to use like uh, the expected condition stuff. So I, I'm waiting for an element to be present, or I'm waiting for the visibility of this to be here. Um, iron those things out so that it's really fast and ironed out as much as you can. Um, that's the biggest thing for for Sauce Labs. You know, is it's going to be slower and understand that it's going to be slower. But the advantage is I can just farm this out to this thing and let it run. So we usually have our jobs run overnight uh, for long running things. Um, yeah. I would love, one of the things that I really would love to try uh, to figure out is how to spin up multiple Sauce Labs connections and then like divvy up the work. So I say, okay, I can run four concurrent things and do that. But I have, I have no idea how to do that. But it would be a really cool idea. Um, I would love for someone to build that for me, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, one, one uh, CI uh, provider you didn't mention, CodeShip, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> actually uh, provides uh, parallel uh, t test runs. Mm, yes. So. Yeah. So you can definitely, you can do that. I think um, with, with Jenkins too, you can do, uh, if you do like a build flow, you can also set up like parallel jobs. So that's definitely an option, like setting up, uh, breaking up by, uh, you could break them up by tag or by individual feature. So that's another thing that would be useful to do. So okay, I'm gonna run this feature with this job and this feature with that job. And you get something kind of like parallelism. Yeah, uh, good point, on. thank you. Um, other questions? All right, sweet. Oh, in the back, body. Is it free? Yes. Uh, Sauce Labs is not, though. Um, <laughs> Selenium is free. Behave is free. Uh, Chrome Driver is free. Sauce Labs is not free. Uh, so their model is, you'll, if you go and sign up, you get a 14-day trial, and then they charge you like 
a certain number of minutes for how, like, so your Chrome driver is running and they, they charge you based on the number of minutes you buy a bucket of them. Um, and then I usually, like for corporate accounts, they'll do like unlimited manual testing, which is nice. So if you're like, I want to see if there's an IE bug that is causing me ha havoc, um, you can just go in there and uh, you can spin up a manual session, point it to your, point it to your uh, website and test it. So that's a nice feature. Anything else? Great. Uh, thank you guys very much for attending.